five years since I really. But... Sorry, John. Yeah, it's only about um, five years since I really sort of named anxiety for myself. And it's been transformative for me in all sorts of ways. Let's understand, first of all, what anxiety is. Anxiety, I've got a little definition, which I quite like. A state of uneasiness about what may happen. A state of uneasiness about what may happen. One of the first things that I discovered about anxiety is that I had constantly misnamed it. I called it stress. And stress, I go, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. I go, I'm stressed about that. As soon as that thing stops, I won't be stressed anymore. I'll do something about that thing. I wasn't stressed about that thing. I was anxious. I was in a state of uneasiness about what might happen in every situation every situation i'd go in and i'd be uneasy about what might happen and when nothing was happening i'd be uneasy about the fact that nothing was happening and so the anxiety wasn't a stress about a particular thing it was a constant relationship to the world a relationship of uneasiness and yes it's it's not just a you know it, it might be experienced as a faintly unpleasant uneasiness but its effects are devastating. I mean, the door to understanding anxiety was open for me in the most brutal way possible. I had a heart attack. I mean, I'm 55, busy, fit, healthy, look after my body, lots of exercise, physical performer, traveling all over the world. I know all about mind-body connectedness. Thank you very much. I've written books about it. Bang, there goes my heart. And undoubtedly, a significant reason for my heart attack was the pressure I put my body under by overworking, by over-efforting, by constantly trying to be amazing and perfect. Undoubtedly, the continual activation of the nervous system caused, about, caused by my anxiety had simply put my, me into permanent level of sort of fight or flight or faint or fawn or whatever the particular state that of the nervous system that I was in at any given time I was constantly slightly aroused very seldom reached the point of um relaxation and that's devastating it leads to mental health problems it leads to physical health problems it can lead to workaholism uh undoubtedly it made my diabetes worse and so on so Realizing that I was anxious was was the first big breakthrough. And you know, we need to ask, why do people stay anxious? Well, the first reason people stay anxious is that they don't know they're anxious. I mean, that's the thing. You go, I spent decades with this uneasiness, and you just end up thinking that that's the way the world is. But actually, as I've already said, the first step towards changing anything is noticing and acknowledging it. So the first reason people stay trapped in a cycle of anxiety is simply that they haven't noticed they're anxious. Doesn't mean they're stupid. It means they haven't noticed. Perfectly all right. First step of moving beyond anxiety, of course, is to notice that you're anxious. I'll come to moving beyond in a moment. But a second reason people stay trapped in anxiety is because they immediately leap into judgment on themselves for being anxious. You begin to go, my God, I'm anxious. That's wrong. I'm bad. I'm a failure. I must stop it. Or you resist it. No, I'm not anxious. Anxiety is a bad thing, and I'm not a bad person. I'm smart. I don't. We either judge or resist or both. And so instead of just being anxious, we're now anxious and worked up about being anxious, using twice as much energy. Sometimes another reason we get caught in anxiety is because we go, anxious? Nonsense. No, I'm busy. I'm going to do that. 
haven't got time to be anxious. I've got this to do. I've got a life to lead. I've got a career to earn, to, to build. I've got money to earn. I've got, you know, Facebook to check. Anything except sitting with your anxiety. Distract, distract, distract. And, you know, if you are in a state of heightened in nervous system arousal, and you decide to constantly distract yourself with stuff, what are you going to do? You're going to arouse your nervous system even more. Again, you are compounding the problem rather than solving the problem. And of course, the third particularly vicious or fourth particularly vicious reason people stay trapped in a cycle of anxiety is because they notice they're anxious and that makes them anxious. And then they notice they're anxious about getting anxious and that makes them really anxious. And so we spiral deeper and deeper into this place of worrying about being worried or getting stressed because we're stressed and all the time underneath it, we are simply compounding the anxiety. We are reinforcing this habit of being uneasy about what might happen, things that might happen. Now, the, the clue to our starting point for breaking this cycle of anxiety, whatever process we've taken for trying to avoid it, like getting distracted or whatever, but the clue to starting to break it is in the definition. If the definition is a state of unease about what may happen, the clue to breaking that unease is to move your attention from what may happen to what is happening. I call it a very simple shift. I call it the shift from what if to what is. Very simple. Get away from going, what if, what if, what if, and go, what is? Now, what, what does this really mean? It means becoming present. People go, oh, my God, what's presence? And now we're going into some big thing. Presence is dead simple. Presence is connecting with now. That's all it is. I've got the simplest definition in the world for presence. Presence is not being distracted. When you're distracted, you're thinking about this and this and the past and the future and parallel universes in which space aliens are going to come down and blow up New York, you know, which wouldn't be a necessarily bad thing, but that's another thing altogether. When you are present, you are going, okay, what's happening in this room now? I, don't, I can't tell what's happening outside. The world might have ended out beyond the window. It's dark. I can't see. What's happening in this room right now? What's happening in my body right now? What can I hear? What can I see right now? Now, this coming present 50 times a day, not, you know, for one week in the Himalayas once a year. No, 50 times a day going, come back. This is the circuit breaker. This is what breaks the circuit of anxiety, the vortex of thoughts, and allows us to move into reality, away from fantasy and into reality. Now, what happens when you come into reality? Well, give away your judgment. But what if I should have... Come to reality and say, what is? Yeah, I'm feeling a little bit tense in my chest. So I'm going to pay attention to relaxing my chest. Doesn't matter what happens in the meeting tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Right now, I'm going to pay attention to relaxing my shoulders, relaxing my chest. I'm going to breathe slowly on the out breath and slightly more quickly on the in breath. Because when you breathe on the out breath, you relax, you uh, engage the parasympathetic nervous system, which relaxes your body. When you breathe in, you engage the sympathetic nervous system, which arouses your body. So pay attention to long, slow out breaths and go. <sighs> Break the cycle of anxiety. Break the cycle of judgment. 
And in the moment of quietness that that can create, begin to learn to observe your thinking. Not judge, not change, observe. Judging and changing happens down the line when we are no longer anxious by default. Because if you try to change it to anxiety, you're gonna have anxious choices. First, we have to break the cycle of anxiety. And when we have created greater inner stability, then and only then are we in a fit state, are we healthy enough to make informed choices about how we want to change. Not how we have to change, how we want to change. So what you do, become present, drop judgment, observe your thinking. So a quick question for you, and I'm just going to give you 30 seconds of silence to consider it. Just in the last week. Can you name for yourself something that you recognize that you were anxious about? And can you now just very quickly go, yeah, what I was actually anxious about was a what if. It was a what if. Can you just make that little link now and go, yeah, I was feeling all of this stuff. But it was actually about a fantasy something that might or might not happen. Just 30 seconds, just think of a recent anxiety and think of it in terms of what ifs. And if you can notice them, smile at yourself. Don't worry. It's just because you're a fool. But don't worry. We're all fools. It's called being human. I want to pass you back to Sorrel. Thanks, John. And if anyone is happy to do so, you could put it in the chat. But there's no obligation to do that because I can understand that it could be slightly embarrassing to admit to one of those what if thoughts. And I'm going to move on to taking back control of your feelings. Um, so a lot of us think our feelings are not a good idea. They get in the way. They make seem to make us unhappy. Unless, of course, they're happy feelings, which is different. But actually, all our feelings it deserve our love and attention. And when we do that, we have much better mental health and physical health and healthy relationships. So people tend to fall into two categories, apart from the ones who embrace their feelings. And this is about embracing, isn't it? This women are. So the people who don't embrace their feelings tend to go one of two ways. They either put their feelings in a box and close the lid, or and we call them blockers or they're engulfers, and engulfers engage in unbridled self-expression, which basically means that um, you, you go home to your spouse and you dump all your misery on them, and then you wonder why they're cross with you, or they go in another room and try and get away from you. And actually, as, as we learned last week and last week's webinar with Thor, Anyone was, I don't think anyone was there, but Thor was talked about this as crocodiling, sobbing, snapping, raging. So that's unbridled self expression. And neither of those, the first one is really, really bad for the person who's blocking it because they're holding all their emotions down. And of course, for an engulfer, it's bad for their other half or for whoever it is they dump on. Um, and, in, and it also means that you haven't learned to work with your feelings. Um, so, what you can do instead, and this is like a forced, in fact, maybe I'll call the slide up here because this is quite a useful slide. It's like a four stage process. Uh, bear with me for a moment. 
So you start by accepting what you feel. So instead of trying to pretend you don't feel this, you accept that you do. And then you're going to show yourself some, compare, some care and compassion without judging yourself. So never judge yourself for what you feel. And then take ownership because these are your feelings and you created them, but they don't control you. And they usually follow, it's, you know, it's interesting, it's quite closely related to what John was talking about in terms of the anxiety. The feelings come partly from our thoughts and partly from what's going on in our bodies. So, you know, I know that if I'm really hungry, I can get really hangry. And I can call people some really nasty names, who I will, words I would never dream of using normally. If I hadn't been hungry, I wouldn't have said that thing. Um, and that came out of a feeling, of, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this stuff. Um, so that's about taking ownership and recognizing where they, that they're your feelings. And nobody else can inject feelings into you. you it's not true to say, you make me so angry. All you can say is, I get really angry when you, whatever it might be. Um, and then be curious about why you were triggered. So yeah, the feeling was going to have been triggered by something that happened just now. Like the woman who thought she knew all about Quakers when she didn't know anything. Um, which And I was so angry and I called her a really rude word, which I'm not going to repeat in public. Um, but that feeling has its origins in your past. It's something that comes when you're triggered because you've got an, a, part, a neural pathway that responds in this way in response to that kind of trigger. And as like I said already, the fact that I was hungry or if you're tired or just generally under the weather, your feelings are going to result from that as well. So I'm just going to talk about a case study. But this is one of John's case studies. We got a bit mixed mm. up, didn't we, John? Do you want to talk about Petra briefly? Or do you want to talk about her or shall we leave yeah. it at the yeah. end? No, let, let, let me just mention Petra because she's interesting. Um I'd, okay, I'd, I'll be honest. Petra is an amalgam of two people, uh, because I would never. I would actually. I wouldn't just give a case study direct because that would feel a little bit like telling somebody secrets. Uh, but this comes from two people. Petra was really interesting. Uh, Petra was a originally a performer, like many, many, many artists, she uh, couldn't earn a living. So she became a teacher uh, of, of drama in a school. And it was fine because she was passionate about drama. She loved teaching drama. She loved, you know, directing kids and so on. And because she was really good at it, she was made a head of department. So manager, you know, not just head of drama, but head of drama in English and music. <laughs> And she suddenly found herself in a situation where she started wanting to be an actor. And now people were constantly coming up to her after she'd been teaching all morning and going, oh, you've really got to talk to Matthew about this. Have you picked up those books for me yet? We've got to talk about budget for the school show. And she would be going, leave me alone. Leave me alone. And we talked it through. And a couple of things came up which were really interesting. First of all, she had been trained, like many women, not only women, but many women, she had been trained by her parents, particularly perhaps her mother, that she had to be perfect and to please people all the time. Always constantly saying yes to people. Just because somebody asked something from her, she somehow she felt that she had to give it. You know, oh, I'm obliged to do something because somebody's asked me. And constantly trying to be perfect. And then she'd been sent away to a boarding school at about the age of 11, I think it was, or 12, something like that. And uh, constantly in competition with people. So she always felt that she was being imposed on. And when people were saying, I need this from you, I need that from you, it was triggering those memories of constantly being imposed on. But it wasn't only that. It was also because... It was lunchtime and she was hungry. A really interesting study, you know. The There was a study of judges on the parole board deciding which prisoners get released and which don't. And you had a massively more likely, you were massively more likely to get released if your case came up immediately after lunch than immediately before lunch. 
because with every attempt not to be biased, the judges were hungry and it changed their perception of things. It's, she was hungry. So solution, she just put in place a very simple thing where if people rushed up to her in the staff room, she'd go, oh, look, I've been teaching all morning. I'm really hungry. Can we talk about this in the second half of lunchtime? Nobody got upset. She didn't get triggered from the past. She took care of her needs. And the situation was resolved. She was not being driven by a situation she couldn't control. She had said, no, I will take a simple, respectful decision to be in charge of this situation. I'm not going to boss anyone around. I'm not going to shout at them. I'm just going to be in charge of this situation. And it came from, well, it came from a conversation, but the conversation was a process of reflection. I took her through a process of reflection. You know, what's going on in your body at this point? She says, I'm hungry. Which, okay, that's not the answer then. She was a, it was a great, but, but it, as I say, it's a mouthful of two people, but both of them had very similar situations and they both made massive changes in their lives by those simple actions. Your sorrow. Thank you, John. So I think actually what John's story demonstrates is that there's a lot of information in our feelings and the feelings that Petra had in the staff room were partly about the fact that she was hungry. That was part of the information she was getting. And then the fact that she could reflect back into her past and see where it was coming from. So um, what would be good now would be if you could just take, again, maybe 30 seconds to ask yourself, what feelings have you been avoiding that you'd be curious or you'd be prepared to get curious about? So this is feelings that you're avoiding rather than feelings that you're happy with. And then just, you know, have a think about that. And maybe what might you discover when you get curious? Um, maybe go back to John. As we're moving to the big word, we're moving to the T word, trauma. We're moving into the big one. Because we said we wanted to uh, cover three things in this session. Anxiety, why in particular why resisting anxiety makes it worse. And we can think of anxiety as a sort of a foundational state that many of us, particularly if we've had in one way or another disruptive childhoods, anxiety is a foundational state for many of us. And challenging and breaking that foundational state is a crucial starting point to making any kind of progress in life moving beyond this sense of continual unease and dis-ease. Sorrel's just been talking about strategies for beginning to take control of the feelings that arise up. If you're going to become present and move beyond anxiety, you're going to feel things. Now we begin to, we need to begin to have strategies for sitting with, living with, and beginning to move beyond being controlled by the feelings that start to rise up. But then we move to the fact that for many of us, there are significant events or significant periods of our life that continue to echo into our lives today. Yeah, for me, uh, being, although I don't remember one of the things about people who went to boarding school is that there's quite often elements of amnesia in there. I don't remember the days, I, my first weeks at boarding school. I mean, I literally don't remember them. In fact, there's whole swathes of my time at boarding school from the age of eight until the age of 18, 10 years, whole swathes where I remember very little, very little. I remember key events, 
some enjoyable. I had some good times there and some highly traumatic. There are two things going on there. One is the what we would call the traumatic experience of being sent away to a school at the age of eight. And the other set of things is a set of traumatic experiences around um, being bullied. It was a boarding school. My dad was a teacher there. He went home in the evenings. I didn't. It wasn't a good mix, you know. <laughs> uh, so the event might not be a single event. It was a period of my life which was traumatic. And that period of my life continues and will always be part of how I interact with the world. But if I am to take any kind of ownership or agency in my life, I need to be able to move beyond that traumatic experience controlling me. I'm not going to pretend it didn't happen. I did that for decades. It didn't work. I am going to move beyond it controlling me. Now, this means we have to talk about trauma. Of course, it's a massive topic. And Sorrel and I have talked a lot over the weeks as we've been planning this and planning the big program we're launching soon. Um, we are both really deeply uncomfortable. In fact, I, I'm more than uncomfortable. I'm angry about the way things are sold online. Do this one thing and your trauma's gone. Just like that. Do this little thing three times a day and you'll never be upset again. Oh, and here's how to earn $40,000 a month as well. You know, cheap answers to complex problems. I cannot say anything that will solve your trauma. What I want to do just here, though, is suggest a very clear starting point for coming to terms with either traumatic events or traumatic experiences. By traumatic experience, I mean an extended period of, of something. By an event, I mean a specific thing. And, and to, to start with, I, I was sort of thinking about this, and I went, I don't even have a good definition of trauma. So I looked around for a definition that really spoke to me. And um, I came across this one from the, I think it's a Canadian Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. Um, it's trauma is the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. I'll just leave it there. Trauma is a lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. And that's so useful. Trauma is not a distressing event. Trauma is the lasting emotional response to an event. Now, sometimes people say, you know, you get over trauma by, you know, you made the trauma in your head. It's as if it's all your responsibility. That's claptrap. That's nonsense. If a traumatic experience happens to you, it is not your fault or responsibility. The trauma we experience, though, is something that is within our ability to change because it is within our emotional responses that the trauma exists. So it's not about saying, get over it or you're at fault for being all traumatized by something that somebody else was, you know, not traumatized by. But it is saying the power to heal is within each of us. It takes humility. It takes patience. It takes unconditional self-love. But the power to change is within us. Now, one of the things that people do when they try to come to terms with traumatic events or traumatic experiences is that they try, they revisit them continually again and again, visiting them, trying to understand them, going through it again, wishing things were different, completely understandable, really understandable, but fundamentally pretty much useless. Not entirely because sometimes the understanding opens doorways to 
understanding ourselves. But the past is the past. All of the thinking about it doesn't change any of it. And the problem with that constant revisiting, as I'm sure we all know, is that the more you repeat a pattern of thoughts, the more likely you are to repeat that pattern of thoughts. Every time you go back through an event, you create neural pathways, which means you are more likely to repeat that pattern of thinking. Which means in trying to understand your trauma, the danger is that you get into the habit of constantly revisiting the trauma and constantly re-triggering the emotional response, which is in fact where the problem lies. So, what do we do instead? Well, again, I would suggest that the starting point is to be found in the definition. Trauma is a lasting emotional response. We need to stop it lasting. We need to stop it being a continual presence in our lives. And just as with anxiety, the starting point, and, and this really matters to me, I'm going to stress, I'm not trying to offer some snake oil where I say this is the solution to everything. This is the starting point is to become present. It is to leave the past in the past and to say, not what if that hadn't happened? What if I had said something different? What if? And go, what is? What is happening in my body now? I feel tension. Let it go. I feel sad. Accept it. I feel angry. Good, you probably have a right to be angry. Let it be there. There's nothing wrong with being angry. It's a perfectly reasonable response to injustice. Real injustice or just that, like as a child you felt something wasn't fair. Perfectly reasonable. Let it be there. So the start for the process of healing is come present 50 times a day. It's a discipline. Really, it's a discipline. Pick up a cup of coffee, smell it. Become present with the cup of coffee. Walk into your garden, hear a bird song. Pause for five seconds and listen to it. Stop at your desk for a moment and go, there's tension in my shoulders. Oof, don't think that's doing any good. I'll let go of that. Become present. Make an unwavering commitment to caring for yourself. And that means both your health and your sleep and your food and all of that, but also compassionate caring for yourself, understanding that you're damaged and you're flawed and you're, you know, a mess. And so is every other person on the planet. So don't beat yourself up for being human. Give yourself that unconditional self-acceptance, which means accepting your anger, accepting your ugliness, accepting the bits about you that you're ashamed of. Unconditional self-acceptance. Now, that's a lifetime's discipline as well. All of these things are lifetime's discipline. But you know what? It's your life. So why wouldn't you choose to do everything within your power to make it a life well lived. It is a discipline, but it is the discipline of you becoming the version of you you most dream of being. Be curious, who could you be if you put down the emotional baggage of the past? Not who must you be, what should you be? Bollocks to all that. Who could you be? Be curious about it. Constantly checking in with, who do I want to be? My parents said I had to be that. Do I? Society says I have to do this. Do I? Maybe the answer is yes. But check in. 
take ownership over your value system. And again, this is a discipline, a lifelong discipline. Make the conscious choice when you feel that you are a victim of circumstances, a victim of other people's behaviors, to step away from seeing yourself as a victim and to choose to see yourself as someone with power, not power over other people, not power over the world, power over yourself. Choose to be the monarch of your own universe, not the victim in someone else's universe. And then crap will get dumped on you. It always does. Come present, exercise compassion, be curious, re-empower yourself. Now, these are the starting points. What's the next stage? Well, the process of growth goes on forever. But if I'm going to really, really simplify, I'll say this. You know what the second stage is? It's doing the first stage again. And the third stage? It's doing the first stage again. Come present. Re-empower yourself. Walk away from being a victim of whatever has happened and choose to become the monarch of your own universe. Compassion, care, gentleness, choosing to be the person you want to be. So very briefly, and I'm, I stress for the third time, I don't claim that this is the answer to all things because I, I hate that cheapening of the human experience, but I am utterly certain from my own work, from my work of training other people and from all the reading I've done, that these basic steps of becoming present, making choices about the story you tell yourself about being a victim or being a, a, a monarch in your universe, about the offering of compassion, these are absolute fail-safe fundamentals of healing and growth. Absolute fundamentals. So again, 30 seconds, just ask yourself, are there places, perhaps long-standing places, where you feel that you are entirely disempowered, a victim in relationship to the past, a traumatic event or a traumatic experience, big trauma, small trauma, doesn't matter. Something which you are unable somehow to move beyond. And if there are, if you can identify something, and I'm sure you can because we've all got them. If you can identify something, can you see any immediate way that you could just turn it so that you are no longer the victim of that story, but you could begin to become the empowered sovereign monarch of that story. 30 seconds, what would be the switch that you make? So anxiety, feelings, traumas, the fabric that we deal with as we choose to heal whatever's happened to us. And it doesn't matter if it's big things or small things. We heal and we grow. And in the end, those things become our strengths. They become the things that we go because of that, even though I might not be glad it happened, but because of that, 
I have insights into myself, into others and into the world that I would not have had those things not happened. I'm not saying that they're, I'm glad they happened, none of that. But those things become our strengths. And this is a good point to recap before yes. we move on to our offer. So as John mentioned earlier, we have a program that we're going to be launching in January. But before we get to that, um, yeah, just a little recap on what we just talked about. And as John just said, anxiety, trauma, feelings. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention was the kind of problems our clients often face, and that's both of us, both John and my clients. Um, and also we've had these same things ourselves. So the feeling that you don't fit in, the experience, having an experience of anxiety in a pretty much daily basis. And I, like John, I didn't know that I was anxious until somebody pointed it out to me in 2020, which is interesting. Um, the difficulty with expressing your feelings, whether that be that you close them away or that you just vomit them all over people, which is what I think I used to do in the bad old days. And then the difficulties you get in your relationships and that feeling of being trapped by your trauma and I, I able to break free of it. Um, and then the other thing to think about is what will happen if you don't do something about it? And again, from personal experience, marital breakdown, problems in relationships with children, um, health problems, whether that be something more minor or something more serious. Like I've worked with people who were basically could barely get out of bed. They were so badly burned out. And and then that thing of escaping into work and and just kind of burying yourself in your work. So you don't have to think about any of that stuff. And ultimately that leads to burnout as well. Um and what you can have when you start to work through these things in the way that John and I have been talking about, and this is going to sound a bit twee. But actually, you can have a lot more happiness because you're creating your own happiness from inside of you rather than expecting it to be there when you've sorted everything else out. And that brings a bit of peace with it. Much happier relationships, better health, more well-being, bearing in mind that there's well-being inside all of us. It's just how badly buried it is. Um, and then being able to do work that you enjoy and not without burning yourself out. So... Our, I'm just going to share my slides again. Our program is called Journey to Belonging. Um, and the amazing John Britton did the artwork for our logo. So can you all see yeah, my lovely. slide? <laughs> so this is a three-month group program, which is going to start in January. And we're going to have um, six workshops, so roughly every fortnight. And before you get to the workshop, there will be videos. Actually, stick with that for a moment. Um, and some exercises to do. So it's kind of on a cycle where you watch the video, you do the exercise, you come to the workshop, and there'll be an opportunity to, to sort of talk amongst yourselves as we're in the community. And so this program is designed for people, clearly who, people who suffer from the kinds of things we've been talking about. So the anxiety, the difficulty with feelings. If your rel relationships are suffering, if you often feel like you don't fit in and and or I think I would say you experience some kind of abandonment or separation trauma as a child. And that, like I said at the beginning, that could include the fact that your parents were there, you lived in the same house with them, you know, one sent you to boarding school, but maybe your mother was really depressed or your dad was an alcoholic and simply was not there for you emotionally. Um, it's not for people we're looking to address and resolve specific childhood trauma. That's what we're, not, what we're here for. Um, it's for you if you want to address the anxiety or the, the difficult feelings that have come out of that in the present. So we don't want you to, we don't, we're not going to be taking you back into the past. And it's also not for you if you don't yet feel ready to accept responsibility for your own healing. And that's not a judgment. It's just that we all come to this at different stages in our journey. And I mean, I know for myself, it probably would have 10 years ago, I might not have been ready for that yet either. Um, whoa, this is a long one. So I don't know if you can even read this because the print's quite small, but what you will get if you come with us on this journey is less anxiety because you will have learned 
how to to work with your anxiety this is this i had a conversation the other day with somebody actually about when i say or when they say oh i'm anxious oh okay in, in publicly in a networking meeting oh i'm anxious can you be kind to me please the anxiety just fell away it just wasn't there anymore um so that's ability to to recognize and accept and acknowledge and even um what's the word it own those feelings make a huge difference and as john said presence is a big part of that you also get an ability to connect more deeply in in relationships and that could be with your partner or it could be with your siblings or your children or your close friends um you'll get a better sense of belonging and community so and that is going to bring with it a more fulfilling personal and social life because your relation your relationships will deepen um and more better understanding of yourself, more self-awareness. So your confidence and self-esteem will improve. And again, I would say those are things which the confidence is kind of in there. It's just buried. When you start to peel away all the, the, the ridiculous stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, the confidence starts to build. And it also builds what the more we do, the more we engage with life, the more our confidence builds. And self-esteem comes with that too. So better mental health, better physical well-being, just better quality of life and a willingness to look at new opportunities so things that in the past might have been too scary they aren't so scary anymore because we think oh of course i can do that so the program takes you through five stages and the first day step on the program is about values it's about getting clear about what is really important to you or to put it in another way what really is important to you which is not quite the same thing because on many of us, we have our, we've had the same values since we were probably eight years old. They've not changed. They're the things our parents gave us and we've never questioned them. It's like that people, people pleasing thing. And when you start to recognize that actually that isn't what I want to be doing and what I really value in life is this, then you can live with more authenticity. And then the second step is curiosity and compassion. So it's about getting curious about what's it's about everything really about yourself about the people around you about the universe and having some compassion for yourself accepting yourself and this involves spending a bit of time on your own so being present with yourself um and then we'll be helping you connect with your inner sovereign so that monarch of the universe that i love the way john described that and that includes be, getting better at saying no to people and sometimes it can be the way that Petra did it, saying, yes, after I've eaten my lunch in the second half of the lunch break, rather than thinking, oh, God, I've got to say yes now. Um, and we'll be looking at self-care and kindness to yourself and to others. And finally, and we leave this to the end because we've built you up by this point that you can really start to work with the more difficult feelings. However, for some people, you know, things may happen in a different order, but that is the sort of the basis of it. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to John. John, do you want me to take the slides off or leave them on? Um, yeah, you can move on to the next slide, I think. Okay. Let's have a... So Sorrel's already sort of uh, explained this, but I'll just say it again. Oh, that was very strange. A fly walked up my screen. <laughs> And I suddenly thought it was a fly walking up Sorrel's screen. And I got very confused about whose screen was being shared. Excuse me. Go away. Get... Anyway, um, <laughs> the structure is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, stimulus at the start of the two-week cycle is actually three or even four. I can't remember now, videos. They're quite short. It's a total video of about 15 minutes. But basically, each month... Perhaps Sorrel will introduce the topic of the month and then I will give a response to what Sorrel did and then Sorrel will set up an exercise and then there's some questions, if I remember rightly, for you to just think about. Two weeks later, we take it all to pieces in a 90-minute seminar conversation. In between, there will be a group, a WhatsApp group or Facebook group, depending on what people are comfortable with. Uh, there'll be a group where people can chat, but basically stimulus at the beginning and then response at the end. Nice and simple. And then after the meeting, the next video is released. Over the course of that, you will also 
and I guess you can choose when to do this, beginning, middle or end, uh, choose to have a one hour uh, one on one with either me or with Sorrel. You get to choose who to, to have it with. Um, and then you yeah, on the next slide, Sorrel. Thank you. So, yes, we start first of January. Um, first cycle goes to 17th, pretty much. And the price for this, we're actually keeping low at the moment because uh, this is the first time we've run this program. This is bringing together my whole set of approaches to things and Sorrel's whole set of approaches to things, which we've been doing in one-on-one -on -one work. And I've done a bit of small group work around this. And so Sorrel, I think. But it's the first time we put it together into this package. So I think Sorrel's going to talk a little bit more about that. So we're basically keeping the price as low as we can. Um, because you're on this seminar, there's going to be even lower prices offered. But I'll let Sorrel talk about that. Okay, so we're offering an early bird price. Oh, this date is wrong. It's not the 30th. Um, the early bird price is good until a week from today. But as you're here today, we have a super early bird price of £297. So it's a whole £100 off, actually £99 off. If you sign up within 20, 48 hours, so by sort of 8.30pm on Friday. Um, but if you want to give yourself a bit longer, you can have it for, you'll get for, for I can't do the sums in my head, £49 off. So you get for, for 347 and that's good until December the, I'm going to change this now, I'm thinking about it, the 20th. Mm -hmm. Um also, we're offering whether whatever time, whenever you pay, it doesn't matter. Were you we're offering a free access to a course of mine on resilience, and a free copy of John's book, Presence: What It Is. Uh, what's it called, John? Presence: What It Is, Why It Matters, and How to Get It. Okay, that's straightforward. Do you know what? But this presence is so important in all this process. I mean, you can't do without John's book, really. It's that book. Um. Oh, I mean, I was going to just recap my two case studies, which didn't get covered. Um, just as an example of the kind of results we get from this sort of thing. So this is around anxiety. It was a client whose mother has a lot of anxiety and she would go to her mum's house to help out with, I mean, it's quite elderly parents with various things. And mum would always give her a long to-do list. Actually, not necessarily a to-do list, you know, maybe five to eight to ten things some of which were quite important, some of which were really pretty trivial, but she was anxious about all of them. And it was triggering my client to be anxious too, which, which made things harder. So we said, well, I said to one, well, just imagine your mother's anxiety as being just wrapping paper. Like, you know, when people wrap up a, a Christmas present in newspapers rather than something shiny. And then you just throw it away. And it worked. I mean, sometimes you just pick the right metaphor and it really lands for your client. And it really land for, landed for her. So she could then go to her mother's house and think, oh, yeah, okay, mum's anxiety is just the wrapping paper. I don't need to worry about that. I only need to worry about the things on the list. So that was her. And this is not a per, her real name, by the way. I just made up new made up names. That's Petra, who we've seen. And then Roberta, an older lady. Um, she had lived all her life in the shadow of her alcoholic father, there was some other family stuff which I'm not going to go into. Um, but we worked on boundaries a lot because she found it really hard to say no. And her ability to stay present. And at the same time, she could be able to became able to acknowledge that she was no longer a victim of her childhood trauma. And I got an email from her about a month after we finished working together saying, no longer a grieving widow and now a fighting widow, which I thought was really rather wonderful. So... I we've this is just the same things over again. Has anybody got any questions about the program that you would like answered? I'm gonna stop sharing now. Or just questions in general. Or responses to any of the exercise, little thinking exercises you